the firearms were in order to disrupt the entire criminal organization. The effectiveness of this strategy has been recognized by the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General in, a review, in their review of Operation Gunrunner. Three, we attempted to be innovative in tracking and seizing firearms purchased by the suspected straw buyers. Four, when appropriate, during the investigation, we made reasonable efforts to share and coordinate the relevant investigative details with our Mexican law enforcement counterparts. Finally, throughout the, my past 23 years in law enforcement, I have lost some very good friends to firearms-related violent crime. I have witnessed firsthand the grief and despair suffered by families who have lost loved ones in the law enforcement profession. That is why I take very seriously my responsibility and dedicated myself to doing everything within my authority to confront and curtail these criminal organizations that would seek to do harm to my peers and innocent civilians. I did not discard that responsibility in the conduct of this investigation. The death of Border Patrol Agent Brian Terry is one I will mourn for the rest of my life, as I do for all those brave heroes who have taken up the badge to serve and protect and then made the ultimate sacrifice. I express my deepest condolences to the Terry family, and may our Heavenly Father bless him and the Terry family through these very difficult times. Distinguished members, I now stand ready to answer your questions and thank you for the opportunity to make this opening statement. Thank you. Special Agent uh, McMahon. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee. I am Bill McMahon, Deputy Assistant Director, Office of Field Operations for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Thank you for inviting me to this important hearing. Let me be clear from the onset. As the ATF Senior Executive in charge of the West Region, I share responsibility for mistakes that were made in the Fast and Furious investigation. The advantage of hindsight the benefit of a thorough review of the case clearly points me to things that I would have done differently. However good our intentions, regardless of our resource challenges and notwithstanding the legal hurdles we face in firearms traffickers, we made mistakes. But know that I am very proud of the men and women who risked their lives investigating this case. Under tremendous pressure, they continue to work this case and many others we have in the American Southwest. Please do not let our failings impact their noble deeds. Mr. Chairman, I was the Assistant Special Agent in charge in New York City on September 11, 2001. Our offices were in the World Trade Center. I have witnessed great human suffering brought to bear by those to whom violence is a stock in trade. This is one of the reasons I was so committed to bringing down the complex network of criminals operating in our homeland and bringing violence on both sides of the southern border. But in our zeal to do so, and in the heat of battle, mistakes were made. And for that, I apologize. Mr. Chairman, I am no stranger to the great and ultimate sacrifices made by my fellow law enforcement officers. I have lost friends in the line of duty, whether it was in the rubble of the World Trade Center, on the streets of our communities, or in the desert southwest. Nothing hurts more than losing a fellow law enforcement officer in the line of duty. With that in mind, I want to express my sincere condolences to the Terry family. And while the investigation into his tragic murder remains ongoing, and because of this, I may not be able to comment on that investigation, please know that I honor his great sacrifice and I am truly sorry for his family's loss. With that in mind, I appear before you today of my own free will to answer to the best of my ability questions you have regarding this operation and my role in it. Thank you. Thank you all. Before we begin, I have been made aware that all of you, or presumably all of you, received from the Department of Justice uh, Council a letter that uh, speaks specifically to your testimony here today. Uh, and it is from uh, Barry S. Orlo. Did all of you receive that letter? You did not. I did, I did not. No, sir. We, we, those letters were only issued to people that were actually under subpoena, and that is normal for any case that we have agents that are under subpoena by defense or uh, others. Okay. Uh, I want to make some clarifications. The letter uh, infers that uh, you may not be able to answer certain questions here today, and I want to make sure it is clear that uh, where it says, for example, you may not reveal any information covered by Rule 6E of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure related to a matter that occurred before a grand jury. And there's, it goes on, up and above. Now, we have got a former 20-year defense attorney to my right. We have got a former prosecutor in Mr. Gowdy down below, Mr. Meehan, former U.S. attorney, 
and a number of other people who have worked before they came here in law enforcement. I am asking all of them if a question occurs from any of us that clearly would lead to something believed to involve compromising the ongoing investigation or the actual chances of, it, of convicting somebody, that we take a pause. I am not beyond that. If you believe, any of you, that you are asked a question that in this format, would, by it being open to the public, would compromise the ability to convict any of the 20 people now charged or others who you reasonably believe will be charged, I want you to take a pause. On the other hand, I want you to understand, every question we ask, you are compelled to answer unless you assert your Fifth Amendment rights. There is no executive order or uh, executive branch decision that can stop us from compelling that answer. If you believe that you are protecting the ability to reach convictions or to save somebody who is undercover in any other way would be harmed by your giving an answer in open hearing, I want you to assert that we need to be in executive session. The committee can go to exec executive session at any time by a simple vote of the committee or concurrence of the chairman and ranking member. We probably will not go to executive session at that moment, but would pen that question till the end. So understand our intention is to be very clear. We know that, in fact, the cartels continue to operate. We do not want to have material here unreasonably disclosed. I want to make one other thing clear before we start, and then I will recognize the ranking member. This committee has been made aware that there were wiretaps in this Fast and Furious investigation. That was not by the Justice Department turning over material required by subpoena. We will not be going into the details of any subpoena in our questioning, and we do look forward to Justice providing the subpoenaed material in a timely fashion they have not yet done. But again, those are under seal, so their existence, which was obtained and has been fairly widely understood, is no longer under seal. But the details of those at this point, including Kenneth Melson's statement that when he read the details, he was sick to his stomach, is as far as we are going to go on the details of wiretap at this time. This hearing is about our relations with Mexico, what they knew in Mexico, what they didn't know, how the agency did or didn't communicate. That doesn't mean that we may not want other information from you in due time. But I think we want to be very careful that today we have no reason to go into some of these areas, and so we are going to avoid them. With that, if the ranking member has any comments. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Just, may, just some clarifying uh, uh, items. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for what you just said. I think that is a very balanced approach to take, um, and we are all concerned about ongoing investigations and putting people um, in jeopardy that should not be as a result of our efforts here. But I just want to, there may be some, some things, Mr. Chairman, where, um, say, for example, these gentlemen may not even know that they are crossing the line. Um, and, and I know that we are looking into the Justice Department. I, I have no problem with that. But if we have a situation where justice, and I understand we have some justice attorneys here, where they think that there may be a crossing of the line, is there a, a, a way that we can at least pause and just you know, make sure that we are not crossing over into some territory, the very type of territory you are talking about? That's all. I, I think that's and I appreciate the gentleman's question. Although I want that very carefully and sparingly used, since Justice is not an invited guest here today, uh, if you believe that a line of questioning is going down that way, we will entertain uh, a request from representatives of justice. Again, its investigation is about justice. It is about your bosses. We believe that, in fact, there are people culpable for what happened, for the mistakes, as Special Agent McMahon said, the mistakes that were made besides Special Agent McMahon. So we do intend to get to those errors and mistakes. But uh, for the ranking member, absolutely, we want to make sure that if somebody inadvertently starts down a line of questioning, whether you see it 
somebody from Justice brings this to our attention, Mr. Gowdy, who is, certainly understands what it takes to preserve a prosecution, uh, Mr. Meehan or anyone else, that I want this to be a little bit like uh, the quality control line on a Toyota production. Anybody can pull the stop if you see a mistake about to happen. Now, that doesn't change the fact that this letter is a little out of line, and it may be boilerplate, but it, it implies that you don't have to answer. Yes, you do have to answer, but we will use executive session or another setting uh, to get additional information so as to ensure that what we must do does not get in the way of what you all must do. Mr. Chairman, just one other thing. Of course. I am just, I'm just looking at the expression, particularly of Special Agent McMahon. I want to make sure that they understand what you just said. I mean, can you inquire? As, I mean, do you all understand what he just said? All right, very well. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I use the English language so poorly that, that sometimes my wife does mention that, that perhaps just because I say what I mean doesn't mean that they can figure out what it means, too. Uh, but again, uh, set it off at the right tone, because this is important that we get to we have to get to, uh, but do it in the respectful way for the fact that there are lives at stake on both sides of the border uh, of many of your brethren. Um, I will now recognize myself for a line of questioning. Uh, Mr. McMahon, you said that uh, you made mistakes, that people made mistakes. Would you like to give us just one of those mistakes? Uh, sure, sure. Again, as I said, after a thorough review of everything after the fact, uh, I, did, I do see that one of the mistakes that I made personally was, was maybe more thoroughly reviewing some of the documents that were coming across my desk on this case. And, and I think that has been brought out in, uh, in my review, and um, it is something that I know will not happen again. Okay. Special Agent Newell, as recently as yesterday, you called this, you said Fast and Furious is a phenomenal program. You know, it was, I hope, not is. Do you stand by that? Did I? I'm sorry, uh, Chairman. This was quoted in the Washington Post. It came out yesterday, that, and they quoted you uh, by name as uh, having called this a phenomenal program. Do you think, did you at one time think, and do you think today that Fast and Furious was a phenomenal program? I, Chairman, I that quote. I don't know the date of that quote. It wasn't uh, yesterday. It was. I'm sorry. But the, the, it, it came out. Okay. Let me let me rephrase the question. This is back to my inability to okay. work with the English language. Did you ever think that Fast and Furious was a phenomenal program? Well, Mr. Chairman, to answer your question, I believe that Fast and Furious was conceived with the idea of disrupting and dismantling an entire organization. Yeah, but but let's, let's get into the details. Fast and Furious was at its heart about letting guns walk. Your agency knew that if you let guns leave the, be bought by straw purchasers, who you knew, in fact, were straw purchasers, including two felons. And in the opening statement, when people talk about people that had every right to buy them, felons at that moment that they bought them were criminals. They could have been stopped. They could have been arrested. There was an inherent crime. So at least in the case of two of the buyers, they were felons. They bought guns. They committed a crime by buying them. They were allowed to move on and eventually turn those weapons over to intermediaries who got them to the drug cartels. That was always part of the program. Do you think that that was, in fact, whether you say phenomenal, do you think that that was a good idea? Well, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I am not aware of two felons involved in this case. I am informed they became felons during the pendency of the case.